This is the transportation track in the afternoon, and I'm excited to start on my feet with a talk about some things that pedestrians are doing. After, after our talk, we have Kristen Cam from Telenov, and she's doing all things rooting, I believe. Yay. And then after Kristen, um, Kevin, Kevin Webb from Conveil has more magic. So we're sort of moving up the um, complexity of the projects and the, you know, all the modes of, of transportation. <clears throat> Our team is called the Oregon Walks GIS Jammers. Um, and we, um, today we're gonna talk about several of our, the tools that we have developed. And we're going to introduce a new tool that is uh, really fabulous. And Michael will talk about that after I'm done with our small introduction. Our group, this GIS Jammers, um, it began as a collaboration between Portland State University students and the geography department there and a local advocacy, which at the time was called the Willamette Pedestrian Coalition. A few years back, uh, to shorten the name and to maybe get some more members, they changed their name to Oregon Walks. So now officially we're the Oregon Walks Portland State University GIS Jammers. And the cool thing about our team is that we are all volunteers. Um, some of us know a lot about one thing or another. Um, some of us are totally new and we welcome everybody, even if you don't live in Portland. My name is Katie Yuri, and I uh, have volunteered with said nonprofit, the Willamette Pedestrian Coalition, now Oregon Walks. And I've also been on the board of directors where I got quite an education on membership. Um, GIS, open street map, um, open source tools seem comfortable to me now because um, in my past life I did um, product design CAD and then I got into um, the IT side of the world. I'm joined today by Michael Arnold. Um, he has a PhD in computer science from Berkeley and a strong background in integrated circuit CAD. Michael is now, yay, working in GIS and open source tools. And today he introduces a tool that will be very helpful for our organization and we think many other um, organizations. And because we're volunteers, I do need to shout out a thanks for some people who are here or maybe not here. Um, over the years we've had many, many volunteers and some people to mention are um, Ellen Vanderslice, Melilani Sachs Barnett, Scott Parker, and Travis Dreesen. Now, if you're in the know, Melilani is here today and in this room because she's on the OSM board. Thank you, Melly. Melly developed our first data collection application, and it's a web application. I'll show you a quick screenshot of a new generation of that. Um, Scott Parker's sidewalk generator and walkway analysis tool is the core of everything that we do, and we would not be here today if it were not for Scott. Scott is not here today. Ellen Vanderslice is an architect, a city planner, and one of the founders of the nonprofit Willamette Pedestrian Coalition, now known as Oregon Walks. Um, she provides us a good theoretical grounding and sometimes translates our geekery into what anyone can understand. <coughs> To summarize what we've done in the past five years, we listed just a few of them on this screen. Of course, there's the walkway generator, which takes a street center line and models places where people might walk. So keep that concept in mind, because that's a lot about what Mike will be talking about. With that walkway network, it's a model. We then analyze and assigning weights and uh, developing uh, routes for large populations and many destinations, we modeled the effectiveness of different um, improvements that might be put in, especially crossings. Um, also featured on the screen is this web application to inventory curb ramps, and it's a, a nice data collection tool. Um, imagine throwing together some PostGIS, some JavaScript, some open layers, putting it up on GitHub, using CardoDB, and voila, it works, it's great. Uh, last October, I went to 200 intersections and made reasonable judgments about the conditions of curb ramps. And we think this would lead to perhaps in the future decent uh, routing for uh, accessibility.
Now, if you remember, I mentioned I was on the board of a nonprofit. And one of the hard lessons I had being on the board of a nonprofit is that I needed members, I needed money, I needed to motivate people. And when your nonprofit is all about walking or that lovely word pedestrians, it's a challenge. But at the same time, I was trying to figure out and sitting through meetings where people argued about how do we get people to identify as pedestrians. I was looking at John Mitchell's map of, of, of our country. And in the map, it's called um, the map of British and French dominions in North America. Oh, wow, that made me so envious. I, on the map, they showed land being taken from the Iroquois, being taken from the French, given to the English. And I said, wow, why not map a dominion for people who walk? With OpenStreetMap, new mappers are laying claims to new dominions. There's a growing dominion of bicyclists tagging ways. Pedestrians are doing the same with the rich set of features about footways, paths, living streets, and the steps found in OSM tags. Thank you all OSM mappers. OSM also, by being crowdsourced and global, sets the game going for an organization whose mission is changing transportation priorities. <clears throat> Adding and correcting data about footways empowers pedestrians and it can represent in a more nuanced way a view of where people might walk. And this might be a new truth, not the truth seen by City Hall, but the truth seen by people on the street. So before I turn this over to, to Michael, I again want to thank the OSM community for uh, reaching out globally and making sure that we have rich data to use in every part of the country and that there is growing data around the world. So OSM is global. It's local, and we think the future. And um, so now I'd like Michael to explain his fabulous new tool and some of the work that Scott has done. Let's see. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, I'm very glad to be here today. Uh, I had the fortune to practically stumble upon the last Sodom uh, SOTM in San Francisco last year, and I was so impressed with OpenStreetMaps. I was aware of it prior to that, but not the quality and the momentum and the enthusiasm. And it, it really was apparent to me that this was not just something cool, but it was something that was important and had traction and I wanted to be part of it. So personally, I decided to explore GIS, open source GIS as a preparation to see if I could work in this area. And uh, uh, Stamen Designs opened up this map time uh, weekly get together to help people like me. Uh, also, I think partly that was came out of the uh, Sodom experience because it followed right on its tails and it was great for me. And then uh, just a few months ago, uh, through some of my friends in Portland, I was invited into this uh, great project that Katie has introduced. Uh, and uh, my basic mission was to uh, hook it up with OSM. Prior to that, uh, all this stuff was happening, but it was happening with uh, government uh, jurisdictional data, and uh, it was time to move to OSM. Let's see, okay. So I want to uh, motivate the concept here of a walkway network, that is to say a pedestrian-oriented network, as being something very distinct from uh, roads uh, alone. You can see that if you look at the, let's see if I have a pointer here. <laughs> well, it's not very visible. Whoop, <laughs> hold on. That did not work. Thank you, that's wonderful. Now I need to find a way to get my pointer back here. There it is. Wow. There we go. 
Okay. Much, thank you so much. So if you look at this uh, picture just here, it tells an awful lot of the story. You see there's housing on this side of the street. There's a bus stop over here. Um, so clearly people want to be able to walk across that street. You can imagine during busy traffic times or possibly all day long that that's not so easy. The nearest pedestrian crosswalk is, is virtually off the picture. So if you just look at the road data, it doesn't really tell the story here. We need something else to accurately represent the pedestrian experience on the ground. Of course, the condition of sidewalks matter, you know. Uh, you see some people actually walking in the street here because the sidewalk kind of ends. Uh, but uh, so we need to model sidewalks. We also need to, of course, model uh, paths that don't happen to run along streets, which are many of which are in open street maps now. Uh, but intersect crossings are very important. So uh, that leads to this picture. I'm not going to dwell on this too much right now. But we've got a network where crosswalks are explicit, sidewalks are explicit, and now we have an opportunity to weight these things to indicate how difficult they are for pedestrians, and then we can start doing some analysis based on that. So the first steps are to get to this sort of a network and then to weight it. So I'm going to talk about that process a bit. So as I, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this project was living over here. There's very obvious reasons. I don't think I need to dwell on why we want to use open street maps. It's user-based. It's ground-based, uh, editable. And these are big, too. It's worldwide and seamless. Uh, with this kind of data, anybody who's ever worked with it will notice where there are, where there are jurisdictional boundaries, there tends to be problems integrating the data. So having a, a single set that works without regard to political boundaries is very important. Uh, so there was a lot of reasons to come over here. And I, you know, my initial thing was, well, that's a great project, and it's not that hard, and we were just going to switch over. But Scott, who spent years with this stuff, said not so quick. He said there's, there's a lot of stuff over here that was potentially very useful to our purposes that either is not in here or not even appropriate to be in here. You know, uh, government organizations will do studies of traffic volume and actual traffic speed. Uh, and this is in the service of something, partly in the service of something called gap analysis, where they want to know wait times at intersections. This is really pretty important to what we're doing. How long is somebody going to have to wait to cross the street? Uh, there's also some advantages to having people that are following, uh, you know, uh, centralized standards so that all the data looks alike. Uh, and uh, this is, tends to be used by uh, government planners which is the community we're trying to influence. But it's also got data in there, in there indicating, indi uh, indicating plans. You know, what, are, what, is the, uh, what is the intent for this street? What is the intent for this neighborhood? So there are some reasons to want to use this. And Scott asked me uh, to not just provide a, you know, a path to get open street map data in, but find a way to be able to use both. And that's uh, where my matcher comes in. I just started working on this, you know, end of December, January, so it's not very old, but I, I think it's pretty exciting. I'm going to spend a little bit of time, I have a little bit, yes, on, you know, what it does. And I think it may have, uh, I'm I really expect it has uses far outside of this project. So I'm going to spend a little time on that. And then I'm going to talk about the walkway generator which is another kind of maybe unusual tool we use. Uh, the idea is that even though there's sidewalk data and OSM, it's not complete. I mean, it's far from complete. There's a lot of roads that where the sidewalks are implied. So there's a semi-automatic program that fleshes out the model to cr create sidewalks and crosswalks so we have somewhere to hang the weights. And that, that's, I'll spend just a little bit of time on that, and then I'll quickly show some of the analysis that can be done with this and has been done with it. Let's see. So uh, 
I, I can't really go into how the matcher works. I will say, it, I mean, I just don't have time. But I will say it uses the network connectivity and the locations of things to match things up. I mean, you have these two networks that you're matching up. So you actually have very rich data there that can be used to do the matching. But you start run, immediately run into, whoops. <laughs> you immediately run into uh, obvious issues. OSM ways tend to be rather long. Uh, they don't break at intersections. So uh, if you just, these things may or may not be offset in real life, but if you imagine you have the OSM data and you have the government data and you're trying to match them up, uh, the first, you know, in, in the service of doing that, what I need to do is break things up so that you have segments that can be paired up. Right now, if you look at this way, you know, these three segments over here, uh, below, you know, overlap with that way and probably some other stuff. So there's some splitting up that has to happen. Uh, and this is just to suggest that. So we've added these breaks into this way. So there's one parts one, parts A, B, and C. And actually, there was a missing break. It, it's not just the OSM data, the government data too. You need to add uh, breaks so that you have things that can be paired up. And once you pair them up, uh, you have this, these correspondences that can be used so that the OSM way ID can be of this way can now be assigned to each government segment that is related to it. And similarly, whatever IDs, foreign keys you have over here can be assigned into this network. So the overall idea is that, you know, let's look at it from the OSM side. You, uh, you break it up as needed. Uh, without, nothing's getting moved around, you're just breaking up segments and then you can attach uh, keys that point into the government data and then you can do your joins and basically use all the attributes from either source down the stream. That's the concept. Whoops. So uh, after this is done, uh, it, it may seem straightforward but in practice it's not real easy and sometimes there are things that get matched that maybe shouldn't be. So uh, I generate a sep separate pass uh, using lots of different factors. Uh, you know, if two things match, they, uh, two streets match, but they have totally different names, that's suspicious. Uh, so that's one thing to look at. If two things are matched, but actually, you know, at somewhere in the segments they go very far divergent, that's not a good sign. Uh, you look at the bearings at the endpoint. If something heading north is matched to something heading west, uh, you know, it may be a mistake. And then you can actually look at bearings along the entire pass, paths, uh, to kind of get a sense of shape. Are these things similarly shaped? And this is extensible. You can use any of the attribute data or geo data associated with uh, the matched segments. Uh, but the idea is to use this to get a confidence indicator between, uh, I get just do it between 0 and 100. Uh, so this is just, uh, this is the Portland, OSM data for the Portland area and the color coding here indicates the, comp, the match scores or the confidence. The uh, green ones are well matched, very high confidence. Whatever is red is very low confidence. You can see it's scattered out and then there's some in between colors as well. The, uh, the ones that are green probably are, are almost certainly correct. The ones that are red are almost certainly indicating problems that I still have to work on in my program. And some of the in-betweens can actually indicate cases where, you know, one of the sources uh, isn't drawn very well, say, the geodata. They really do match, but they look considerably different. Okay. Um, let's see. I just want to suggest that there are a number of things that can be done with this. Uh, the, what we're kind of using it for, I, I, the, I think the GIS term is conflation, which means we want to take two sources and combine the data for our use. Yes, five minutes? Four minutes, okay. Well, we'll see what we can do. Uh, data checking, uh, it, I'm actually doing this uh, a little bit already. We've got, street, I mentioned street names. We're things with a high match score, but the street names are totally different, probably indicate one of the sources has the wrong name. So that's the sort of thing you can go back and look for the look for trouble. This could be used in conjunction with imports. Uh, different versions of, from the same network can be compared. 
And if you've tied data to one version of a network and you want to move that forward, I think that would be a very useful, uh, a, a possible use for this. Uh, I'm going to move ahead here. So I obviously don't have a lot of time left. Uh, the other interesting program is a semi-automated walkway generator, which I mentioned before, actually takes the centerline data and creates crosswalks and sidewalks uh, automatically, but under user control. You can go in with as much uh, detail as you want to manipulate this. Uh, let me just get quickly to what, uh, well, almost. So they're actually, uh, as we switch over to OSM, we're, we're running into more explicit sidewalks, so we're dealing with this issue of implicit and explicit mixed together. Uh, there's a tiny little jogs in walkways that are kind of hard for the walkway generator to deal with. So we're looking to move this forward by either making the walkway generator smarter or we're, th we're actually leaning towards an, a pre-pass where we actually uh, process the data so it'll work with the walkway generator. Uh, I guess I'm nearly out of time, so I'm just going to suggest some of the analysis. This is an A-B sort of analysis. It's a what if, what if we do some improvements here with crosswalks and sidewalks? And we're looking at uh, the nearest grocery stores are the stars. They're just kind of a proxy for points of interest. And from all these intersections, suddenly there's, a nearer gross, there's another grocery store that looks better in terms of walking. Uh, the color coding shows there's less need to go to this one here. This red means this is used less. The green are used more because, you know, the crosswalk, crossing the street has gotten easier. Uh, it's an example. Uh, just very quickly, this is a heat map uh, idea where you can see where are the barriers to pedestrian transport. You can see along the freeways. Sometimes it's subdivisions where streets don't go through, but the dark areas indicate the barriers to transport. Uh, this is just another visualization of something similar. Uh, if you start adding populations in, that's what these little dots indicate, dwellings, uh, you can start looking at improvements times the number of people that, uh, that are advantaged by that. So it's, it's a net benefit sort of thing. And that can be turned into a, a surface sort of model, a different visualization. Um, so. What we've got here, I've talked about the matcher particularly, I've talked about the walkway generator. Here is the entire kind of tool stack. Um, what, uh, one of the reasons we're giving this talk is because we're trying to get people interested and there's a lot of things that can be done. Particular opportunities are working on this missing link right now uh, which will allow an easier use of the OSM data as input to the walkway generator. This would be a QGIS Python sort of plug-in. And we're hoping somebody will get interested in that other than me. Uh, visualization, there's tremendous opportunity. We, we have this ability to do very fast analysis with routes, but how do you make that data accessible to people? And in the longer run, we've got this ArcGIS plug-in, which is great, but in terms of making it available to more people, we're thinking, you know, a, a pot, QGIS port would be interesting, but not just a straight port, but something that is designed, you know, the ultimate goal is to get away from just GIS uh, professionals and try to make this something that a broader group of users has access to. And uh, I believe that's it. Uh, we, there are some papers that have been written on this stuff, and uh, we got email addresses for anyone who wants to contact us. This is all going to be published on the Sodom website, so you don't need to try to read or jot this down. But thank you very much. Thank you.